Forty years ago, the cost of staging the 84 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles was around $300 million. This year, for the Paris Olympics, they will spend more than that just on security. I'm Larry Fedorik, and this is Later That Same Life. On each episode of my weekly podcast, a different topic, discussion, or story from our lives. Season 13, Chapter 12, Paris Olympics. If dumping all over the Olympics was an actual Olympic event, I just want you to know I'm going for gold. I suffer through the Olympics, at least all of the hype. It's a year-long countdown. Ridiculous overcoverage of every event for 19 days. Billions of dollars thrown to the wind just to get to that 9.6 seconds of the only competition anybody cares about, the men's 100 meters. The cost of the Paris Olympics comes in at around 9 billion euros, 10 billion US dollars, 14 billion Canadian. Get this, Paris 2024 is being called the cheaper games. London costs 17 billion, Rio 23 billion, Tokyo 14. How did Paris come in at 9 billion? Hmm, well, they could be lying about the dollar amount. I mean, not one Olympic Games in the last 60 years has come in on budget. It's expensive. First of all, you gotta paint the whole city. You have to move all the homeless people. And you know where they move the homeless for the Olympics? Off camera. But Paris says they made efficient use of existing sports infrastructure. Although the last time Paris hosted the Olympics was 100 years ago in 1924. Before that, 1900. But it's Paris. It's a world city. With enough swimming pools and stadiums and arenas to host over 10,000 athletes and about as many media, Paris believes that their investment of around 9 billion euros will result in revenues of about 12 billion euros making these games a profitable venture. That, in itself, would be an Olympic miracle. Every couple of years for Summer and Winter Games, the IOC, International Olympic Committee, awards one city in the world a license to go horribly into debt. And that's partly due to this. You have to build expensive, bizarre, sports-specific venues that will immediately become irrelevant after 19 days. What, Larry? Are you saying that every city doesn't need a velodrome, which is a huge arena in which to race bicycles on a hardwood floor? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying you don't need a velodrome. I'm saying the term white elephant was likely coined to describe Olympic venues. Who needs an Olympic-sized swimming pool? Only people who want to compete in the Olympics. It's useless otherwise as a community recreational facility. So some Olympics make money. Most do not. Denver, Colorado is unique in Olympic history. It is the only city to be awarded the games and then turn them down. Brilliant. Those 1976 games were then awarded to Montreal. It remains the only time a Summer Games was held in Canada. Those games were notable for at least three things that I remember. One, Nadia Kamenich became the first ever gymnast to score a perfect 10. Two, the decathlon was won by Bruce Jenner, who became a poster boy for those games. Whatever happened to him? And three, Montreal's Olympic Stadium. It became somewhat of a Elephant Blanc. Crumbling, ineffective as an alternative venue, they experimented with a cloth roof, and they didn't pay it off until 2006. 30 years to pay off a useless building. Maybe they should have looked into a reverse mortgage. And 30 years with an extended tobacco tax as revenue to pay off a sporting venue. No irony there. Thankfully in Montreal, smoking is mandatory. Incidentally, Toronto was bid for the Summer Games at least five times, the last time seriously in 2008. Of course, Calgary and Vancouver have hosted Winter Games. And by the way, Winter Games? We're running out of places on the planet that actually have winter. 
You know who actually makes money from the Olympics? The Olympics. The IOC, the International Olympic Committee. Basically, they own the brand and license it out every couple of years for summer and winter events. Those who bid for the games must spend between 50 and 100 million dollars just to bid. And these are cities, usually with the backing of a state or provincial government, along with some federal money. Gazillions of dollars flow through that IOC committee. The committee has been trying to monetize these games ever since the beginning of the modern Olympics, which started modern in 1896. And that's, of course, as opposed to the ancient games, which began in 776 B.C., the IOC first sold broadcast rights in 1948 to the BBC. Today, about 75% of the IOC revenue comes from selling broadcast rights. And by the way, their total revenue is over $5 billion. And that's only growing with rights awarded to various online channels and streaming services. Another 20% comes from their uh, sponsorship partners. And these are not necessarily the ads that you will see on an NBC or a CBC. These are IOC direct sponsorships. Those are very expensive rights. They allow the advertisers to put their logo in, on, and around the venues. And to use the iconic Five Rings logo on their products. And then the Coca-Cola and the Visas of the world have to spend millions and millions more to basically tell the world that they have those rights and then more money to do feel-good commercials based around a theme of athletic competition, and then spend more millions to buy advertising time on the channels and sites. Again, media rights and sponsorship make up the bulk of IOC revenue. Five, six billion dollars, it keeps going up. Does any of that money get funneled over to Paris to help out with hosting the games? Paris, who have to spend all the money to actually put the games together? No. Not really. IOC does fund some marketing support, but the IOC doesn't really share their revenue with the host city. Yeah, they want to monetize the games. That's fine. Be profitable. Make money. Be a company. But you're the only one that makes money. Billions. They simply put that money into a bank who doesn't allow a lot of questions about their banking. So how does Paris make money? Well, they sell tickets to the event. Uh, the city itself will see an influx of tourists Cabs, hotels, restaurants, et al. Businesses have higher revenue, pay more taxes. One person's spending is another person's income. It's why a lot of cities lose money. The costs are so high, no help from the IOC, and revenues often fall short of expectations. And that is your Olympic economic scamorama. What a concept. You put up all the money, you take all the chances, We'll take most of the revenues. So if you hear an Olympics lost money, it's the city and the governments. It's never the IOC. So who's on this committee? How do you get that gig? You're like the emperor who gets to give the thumbs up so that the fighting can begin and the thumbs down to decide who lives and dies. Every country involved with the Olympics has their own National Olympic Committee. They would submit a person to be a member of the International Olympic Committee. The committee then votes yay or nay on that person. The IOC has 111 members, 38 honorary members. They vote on a city's bid to host the Olympics. In the past, some committee members have been accused, later suspended, for taking bribes from certain bidding cities. Hey, if you're going to spend $100 million to bid for the games, what's a million or two that slips into the offshore account of a committee member? The IOC itself has been investigated by several law enforcement agencies around the world. And in the early 2000s, the IOC addressed the issue and allegedly put new and tougher rules into place. Bribes, corruption, favoritism have long been a part of the IOC. It's an Olympic tradition. A lot of money changes hands. A lot of money is at stake. In the past, it's been criminal. And here's the thing about crime. It doesn't go away just because the laws change. As laws toughen to fight crime, crime toughens to evade the law. I personally have no reason to believe 
that worldwide sports organizations run clean. Well, it all must be worth it, though, to witness the spectacle of international Olympic athletic excellence. I suppose. Summer Olympics have 32 categories of sports, games, and disciplines. Within some of the 32 are multiple events. For example, aquatics. You have swimming, diving, and then varying competitions within those varying lengths of races. Gymnastics has several subcategories, including an event that seems to involve the waving of ribbons on a stick. Equestrians have both the jumping and dressage. Dressage, which is basically horse dancing. Horse dancing is in the Olympics. Track and field has dozens of events within it, including the ever-practical and relatable shot put, javelin, and discus. Skills, which once acquired, can really apply practically for the rest of your life. The Paris Olympics will include competitions in breakdancing and surfing. Eh, sure, why not? Let me know when you add lawn darts. I'll actually apply to be on a team. Add up all the different subcategories, and there are 329 medal events in the Summer Games. Many are very ridiculous. Synchronized diving? Who signed off on that one? If you have synchronized diving, why don't you have synchronized pole vaulting? That would be interesting. The Olympics not only have basketball, they have three-on-three -three basketball. Well, why don't you have three-on-three -three boxing? I'd go to see that. To my earlier point, no one gives a crap about 19 days of archery, handball, and field hockey. Just get me to that 9.6 seconds of racing. Also, for years, I've had this idea that in the Summer Olympics, every event that is held indoors, like swimming, gymnastics, fencing, basketball, etc., should be moved to the winter games. Think about it. Why is it a summer game if you can do it year-round indoors? Summer game fans only care about that 9.6 seconds anyway, and moving them would make the winter games much more interesting. We're running out of places on the planet that actually have winter. Another point is you get caught up in the swell of competition and excellence. Remember that most of the athletes that you are watching have ingested some sort of performance-enhancing substance. Yeah, sure, they all train hard, but no one can be the best in the world at something physical without adding a little something extra. Is it all illegal? Even that is a gray area. World-class athletes take all kinds of supplements to help them train harder, recover faster, sleep better, until they become this amazing machine, and then they let their systems kind of clean out before competition. Victor Conti was the head of Balco. Remember them? Leaders in the field of athletic doping. PEDs, performance-enhancing drugs. He's done some jail time, and now he's become an advocate for anti-doping. Search out some of his videos. They are eye-opening. He can tell you a dozen different ways to beat the anti-doping system. It's the same crime theory. Laws get tougher, criminals get smarter. Testing is a farce. It also sometimes gets political. The IOC or even uh, influential big money sponsors have at times stepped in to make a positive test simply go away. Not good for business at this time to let the world know that this hero athlete was actually cheating. In Russia and China, doping is state-sponsored. And even if you wanted to be a clean athlete, you get caught up in the culture. Clean athlete equates with last place, never heard of you. There is a credo in high-level sports. I believe it exists for current and potential Olympians. And that is, if you're not cheating, you're not really trying. Of course, the actual Olympic motto, by the way, is Sidious Altius Fortis. Faster, higher, stronger. So the question is, if you are faster and stronger, just how high are you? Cheating isn't limited to doping. Witness the controversy around Canada soccer and the use of spy drones to get info on opposing teams. Is it that Canada is the only one doing this, or that they are the only ones getting caught? If a world soccer power got caught, do you think it would be the same? Or is it, let's send a message to all the big cheaters by making an example of Canada? 
I'll bet it's that last one. Recently, PayPal co-founder billionaire Peter Thiel has joined a huge investment group promoting something called the Enhanced Games. They're shooting for 2025. The Enhanced Games. Athletes, under medical supervision, would be allowed to use all the performance-enhancing drugs their body could handle. Then let's see who's faster, higher, stronger. I can understand why people are against it, but on the other hand, it would force us to drop the pretense that the Olympics are the clean games. They are not. I mentioned political influence earlier, and herein lies another Olympic false premise. We should leave politics out of the Olympic Games. This is about the spirit of international brotherhood and friendly competition. Yeah, well, if that's so, why do you compete under the banner of a geopolitical unit known as your country? Why do they rank medal standings by country? Why do they raise flags and play anthems? It's nationalism, which is politics. Why do nations bid for Olympic Games for political sports washing, for polyeconomic agendas, and so forth? The IOC itself is highly political. You build your games on politics and then tell the rest of us to leave politics out of it? I don't think so. It's because of politics that Paris had to spend 400 million euros on security. The Olympics are a perfect opportunity for someone to make a huge political statement. It's the way the world is today. It's why we can't have nice things. And hey, wasn't Paris just burning with protests and riots last year? And again, just in May? Weren't they the home of the Yellow Vest movement? Didn't they just have an election where they narrowly avoided a right-wing extremist takeover? And do we expect all that to go away just because high-jumping is about to begin? I do have a way to avoid much of the security issues, the expense, and all the other problems associated with hosting an Olympic Games. If I do say so myself, it's brilliant. I've promoted this off and on for like the last 30 years. And I truly believe that one day this is the way it'll work. Instead of uh, 32 different sports, as in Olympics, awarded to one city, how about you award them to, uh, I don't know, 32 cities? Or 16 or some multiple? All right, Barcelona. This time you get aquatics and uh, fencing. London, you get soccer. The big event, uh, track and field, Los Angeles. And hey, Seoul, South Korea, thanks for taking archery and uh, canoe slalom. Maybe next time you'll get the track and field. Maybe you could have events that are always in one place. Equestrian is always in Rio. All the events would still be held in the same 19-day period, and they'd be tied together through TV and streaming. As a host city, say of rugby, you'd have to provide the television feed coverage to the rest of the world. Each different organization would still pay the IOC for the broadcast rights. If it's swimming, for example, the entire world would get all the same pictures. Those would be produced by the host of the event. You would just send your own commentators there to send back the play-by-play -play in your country's main languages. Sound crazy? Well, hey, FIFA just awarded the next World Cup to the USA and Canada, who are further splitting the games up among several cities. That is my plan, already working in world soccer. It could work for the Olympics. Save a lot of people, a lot of headaches, and a lot of money. The other fallacy is that these are the world's top amateur athletes. Yeah, right. Well, in cases like basketball, golf, hockey, and others, this is obviously not true. The pros play. In some of the lesser sports, many of the athletes are already professionals in their own disciplines. Plus, many athletes do get paid by their national Olympic organization if they win a medal. Canada's Olympic Committee pays the athlete 20 Gs for a gold medal. Okay, you can't live on that, but uh, it's better than a kick in the ass with a wet boot. And of course, we're supposed to support our Olympic Committee and the athletes who want to become world champions. I've never been comfortable with the fact that tax dollars go toward, say, uh, Rosie over there so that she can practice on the trampoline for seven hours a day instead of working for a living. Hey, we all have dreams. How come the Olympic ones are the only ones that are government-funded? Well, you know, these athletes, they work hard and they make so many sacrifices. Yeah, well, try riding the bus every day to your two minimum-wage jobs that you need to get by. 
who's pinning a medal on that person? I've said this many times before. When I was a kid, I was only allowed to go out and play once I'd finished my homework and done my chores. The Olympics, to me, are we're going out to play when there's still a lot of work to do. The Olympics incur taxpayer debt. It's a security nightmare, a political debacle. Most athletes are doped up. Opening and closing ceremonies themselves cost about a billion dollars each. Can't just fire a starting pistol and say, let the games begin. Oh no, it's got to be a big production. Do any of these things sound like a good reason to actually have an Olympic Games? You know, less than 100 years ago, the Olympics included the arts. See, now that would be good. That's a games I could get behind. That's an Olympics I support. Faster, higher, stronger, smarter. Later That Same Life is written, voiced, and produced by Larry Fedorik. LarryFedorik37 at gmail.com. Subscribe to Larry's podcast YouTube channel. Get automatic notifications with each new episode. Thank you.